Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived chiefly to allow me to spend a little bit more time than is normally available with people that I want to spend a little bit more time with than is normally available. Ed Miliband is here this week. I Thank like your you. socks. You're, well, that's a good spot. I haven't <laughs> even started with a robust questioning yet. Where have they come from? At my advent calendar. I got a sock advent calendar. Wow. So I had a pair of novelty socks every every day for that's all good. 24 days. That's good. I might get one of those. Well, you have to wait till next Christmas. Yeah, thing, exactly. But still, otherwise, it'd be weird. Well, they'd probably get them at a knockdown price. Yeah. I don't know. Um... Thank you for doing this. Thank you for the kind words about my Pleasure. Socks. It's hard to know where to start with you. Full disclosure, we normally start at the beginning, childhood, that sort of thing. But but um, it's tempting to start at the end at the moment. The end? Well, I mean, have a look at... <laughs> I mean, as in now, the end of time as, as it has currently yeah. unfolded. Because because we are in such a such a weird, weird place. Your podcast is called Reasons to be Cheerful. A bit thin on the ground at the moment. Yeah, it's all taxing at the moment, isn't it? Um, I mean, I suppose you're asking me what, what are the reasons to be cheerful. Yeah. We can come back to it. Um, I think I think my hope is that out of what looks like a sort of relatively bleak situation for the country and the world, there is still a unaddressed demand for change in the sense that the country still has big problems. I mean, it's still got the climate emergency, massive inequalities. I think personally that the massive inequalities have driven some of the symptoms that we've seen in the last few years. And therefore, progressives have got to find an answer to those. And, and you know, the election was devastatingly bad, but the election result doesn't change the condition of the country. In fact, I, I fear in the next few years it might make it worse. And mm -hmm. so therefore... You know, we've got to find we've got to find answers, answers that will hopefully be electorally successful, but you know that can that can answer these big challenges that the uh, that the uh, country faces. I mean, maybe I don't quite know. How, so, so, in a sense, maybe that's not a reason to be cheerful. I, I suppose the reason to be cheerful the reason then, not to give well, up. The reason not to give up. <laughs> and the reason to be cheerful is that what the podcast is about is saying actually, if you look around the world at all of the um, at, at these issues, there are countries that are doing it better than us. You know that are address, that are doing better mm. on climate, better when it comes to equality, better when it comes to gender equality. You know, that that think of any problem that we've got, there is a solution somewhere. So that's yeah. that, and 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 also, you know, there's a you can see the dangerous tendencies in today's world, but I think that the the the, the sort of scope for change is very wide. It's not like 20 years ago when I started in politics. You know the parameters are very wide, and there's scary. There's a scary parameter, and there's a more hopeful mm. parameter. It, because the grievances are real, it's just a question of whether yeah. they're addressed by people in good faith or in bad it, faith. It, it, exactly, and uh, you know, so, so, so in so in that sense, that's the reason to keep fighting. You have to. Yeah. No. Or else, else you kind of the you know, curl correct. up under the duvet. Yeah, why was the election result so bad? And did did you see it coming? Uh, I don't think. I mean, I don't think I was that optimistic about it. I think. I think, it, it, oddly enough, I think if you look at the Labour leadership contest, there may be there's obviously disagreements between the candidates, but I think, you know, some combination of perceptions of leadership, Brexit, uh, and the manifesto having, uh, you know, maybe did have some good ideas, but but just not feeling credible to people. I think those three people might have different weightings of those factors. Mm. But I but think there's always a combination broad agreement the among the candidates that it's some combination of of those of those things. I mean, you know, I just so what was, was your answer. Well, I'd agree. I'd, I'd sort of agree with that combination. How would you rank? Them? Oh, I don't know about the rank. I'm not sure I can sort of rank them because Labour uh, members have been polled this morning, and they all come back. Labour members. Yeah. Um, but the main reason by a country mile was Brexit, and, and Jeremy Corbyn comes in with barely half of the. But that's Labour members. I very much doubt that Labour voters would break down, well, along, uh, or potential lost Labour voters would break down along the same. Well, line. I'm involved in this review, which I'm, I'm a part of the team of this review that this organisation Labour Together, which is a broad based, non factional part of the Labour Party, has set up. So I don't want to sort of. I'm not sort of prejudging that. Mm. But. You know, I suppose I saw all those factors in my own constituency. My majority went from 14,000 to 2,300. Mm. Um, and there's no question that Brexit cleaved our coalition. You know, it was sort of, 
uh, you know, the Remainer leave divide was very real, very real. Mine was one of the highest voting Brexit constituencies. Yes. There's no question that the perceptions of leadership were very bad uh, on the doorstep. Um, I think even Jeremy's supporters would would, would say that. Um, and while the 2017 manifesto, I think, l landed for people in a, in a kind of relatively positive way, I don't think it was about the problem of any single idea in the 2019 manifesto, but I think together people thought it just feels too much. Mm. Maybe, maybe there's some sense also in which Brexit felt like sort of big change for people, you know, such disruption. And, and that's the other factor in this, which is I think people did buy the Johnson argument, which is we just need to get this thing off our te television screens and over with. Mm, that's not going so well for him at the moment. No, it isn't, but we'll, we'll to, see. We'll have to watch this we'll space. See. Um, so we, when one looks at the Miliband childhood, uh, the, the son of Polish Jewish immigrants, yeah. very intellectual, Marxist intellectual, it's one of the most overused and, and misunderstood words probably in the political lexicon at the moment, but but your father Ralph was was, was a proper Marxist intellectual and, and his politics were no doubt informed by his life experiences, what was what was home like? Because the only portrayal we ever get is is in the terms that I've just described. But to you, he wasn't... That's capital and eggs for no, breakfast. But, but, but even that, he was uh, just dad, I presume. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. when did you become conscious that you lived in a political household? Um, I suppose quite early on, because it was sort of in the daily conversation. Mm. Um... And, I mean, I suppose my, the first election I remember is 1979, and I remember that we didn't want Mrs Thatcher to win, <laughs> uh, and she did. Um, uh, and then, you know, I just had sort of, form I suppose, formative experiences in my childhood. So uh, I had just turned 50, and we went, I went with my kids uh, and Justine to South Africa, and um, partly we went, to the, we went to the Apartheid Museum and the... Um, uh, a, a sort of museum devoted to the ANC, the armed wing of the ANC in, in Rivonia, where the, you know, Rivonia, the so-called mm -hmm. Rivonia trial of Mandela was, and Rivonia was the place where they'd been sort of planning what they were doing. And a, my father's former student it was a woman called Ruth First, uh, who I met when I was 12, um, and she was married to Joe Slover, who's the Secretary General of the... South African Communist Party, and then a few months after I met her, she was blown up by a letter bomb um, in Mozambique. And, you know, when something like that happens, I mean, I remember she was an incredibly charismatic woman, uh, and when something like that happens in your, you know, in your household, you can't fail to think, mm. you know, politics sort of really is important, and she was really important. But I actually texted Gillian, her daughter, to say, look, you know, I'm explaining to my kids what political heroism means, I mean, on this trip, because, you know, it's just there's, there's a lot about Ruth and Joe in the both of these museums. And, um, you know, it's sort of, I mean, maybe going back to reasons to be cheerful, maybe it sort of puts us, puts, you know, puts our battles in some kind of perspective, I suppose. Yes. I, I, felt, I felt that, you know. Of course. Uh, it's life and death, isn't it? Well, absolutely, it is life and death. And, and, and sort of, you know, massive, massive sacrifices that these, that these people made, Sacri personal sacrifices, sacrifices of their lives, sacrifices in relation to their families. Um, so I suppose it's sort of influences like that were just very... You know, astounding and, and, and devastating. Constant in a way. That was very much Con the environment. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like that sort of. And and you know, the my parents were sort of, you know, normal parents too. But yes, of course. Um, and we had sort of normal family rows. But um, I think I think the other thing that sort of sits in the background, although they didn't talk about it much, was the sort of Holocaust experience. Um, my mum. Uh, spent a lot of time in hiding. Her father was killed in one of the concentration camps. Uh, in fact, we only just discovered where, actually. Really? Yeah, I mean, only in sort of 2014 Grief. or so. Uh, um, and we went back a few years back to see his grave and, and, and so on. But, you know, she was incredibly young. She was in hiding. Um, uh, and my dad fled here with his father uh, just before the Nazis arrived in Belgium. So she, she was in hiding in Poland and he, and, and so they didn't, and they really didn't talk about these experiences much. But I think that, 
you know, the, these things are also in the bloodstream in some way. I think it sort of informed them. It was it made them it sort of drove them forward to be to think, you know, you, you've got to make a difference. So it was a kind of quasi religious sort of I, secular no, I I secular religious. I, no, I think I, because. I, I be, but this wouldn't be true of you, although we're of a similar age. I still find it astonishing when I remember what year I was born to reflect upon how close that was to the Second World War, to the end of the Second World War, because it always seemed to me the Holocaust in particular was done by a different species. So it's mm -hmm. been a big shock to me to see the rise of the far right and to see a lot of these ancient hatreds bubbling back to the surface. Your parents, of course, were motivated... Well, listening to you now, it sounds as if they were motivated by the knowledge that this could happen anywhere and it could happen again. Uh, or not? I mean, uh, yes, uh, but I think they were very thankful for Britain. Of course. Um, I, I, I don't mean that in a sort of trite way. I mean, well, that, I didn't mean to it, suggest. No, that no, but in a in a way, I think. I think in a way, when there was sort of uh, uh, my. Dad died just after in 1994, and, yeah. to, and the Labour lost the fourth election in 1992. And I, you know, I remember his sense that well, okay, you know, it's terrible. He was very depressed. The Labour lost the election, but, but he was sort of he recognised that, you know, this wasn't like no, no, of the, course, the they, circumstances in which I know that sounds a bit banal, but I think it was sort of, yeah, I, 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 I describe more that it drove them to think, um. Yes, one should be vigilant about anti-Semitism, but but I think for for them it drove them more to be thinking uh, you've got to try and change the world. Yes, that you've got to use the time to try and change the world. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, I think that's roughly what I was yeah. alluding to. But my, you're, you're describing it more as motivated by inspiration than by fear, and that's probably a healthier way of approaching almost anything. You've mentioned anti-Semitism, so let's jump forward uh, a few decades. How, how did you? deal with that personally how did you deal with the knowledge that the party was being portrayed in my view rightly i don't know your view yet um as as being a harbor for anti-semitism and yet there, there are you the the son of a of a holocaust survivor i mean it was pain it's painful uh and i think the thing i feel most is that it caused lots of pain to the jewish community in in britain um I mean, you could have been more front and centre, couldn't you, to say, listen, if I'm in this party, it can't possibly be anti-Semitic, and yet you never did that. Yeah. I, I spoke out about the IHRA, the, the definition, which I thought was just... Uh, yes. I didn't understand why we were not uh, accepting it. Do you understand now? Why we're not accepting why, it? Why they didn't then? Why it was such a... Uh, because I think they feared that it would be used to say you couldn't criticise Israel. Yes. Um, and while I'm actually sit, sort of, sit, I'm, I, you know, I've got massive criticisms of, of Israel, I just thought we were, ju we were just not in a position to sort of argue the toss yes. yeah. on that question yeah. <laughs> of the internationally accepted definition. <laughs> um, Put it like that. Uh, right. Whatever the, you know, ins and outs and the details of the examples and, and, and all of that, that that was in a way not a thing for us to pick a fight about. Yes. Um, uh, look, the thing is that people say it's a small problem, and I think actually that's true, but as in small in number, but one anti-Semite is too many. Yes. And so it doesn't matter. The, the, in a way, the sort of the number is not really the point. Because it's there. Yeah, because it's there. So people like Luciana Berger might have expected you to follow her out almost of the party. No, I wasn't going to follow her out. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of... But because I think the Labour Party is the best hope for positive change in this country. Um, and the answer is to, you know get to zero tolerance of anti-Semitism. <laughs> yes, and then rebuild. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, talking to you now, I, I wonder whether there was any other career that could have tempted you or whether you were always going to be destined for the political world. Um, I was... I suppose I felt pressure to be an academic because my father was an academic. Yes. Um, and in a sense, I suppose... It wasn't explicit pressure. It wasn't him saying, you've got to go and be a Marxist professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I kind of... 
he 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 was he had this dualism which was to be quite respectful of electoral politics. Yes. So you know some people who are academics think it's all just a grubby crappy compromise. And I think he thought there was quite a lot of grubby, crappy compromise involved, but he was sort of respectful of trying that. But I think in a way I was brought up to think that the real, the really sort of um, intellectually most stretching thing you could do was to be an academic. And I remember saying to him a couple of years before he died, after I graduated, you know, you know, Dad, that's, it's not really academia that sort of motivates me. And he said, I, I think I, I, you know, he said, I know that and that's fine. Um, so... I think if I'd done something else, yes. maybe it was to be, maybe it would be... Uh, but it would still be politics, but just in a different it would way. Still, it would still be politics. I mean, I suppose where, where I am my sort of father's son a bit is I find myself not following the normal, and maybe you'll come on to this, not following the normal route, which is to become more right-wing as you get older, but to become more left-wing. Hmm. Um, you know, my critique of myself in 2015 is not that I was too radical, but I wasn't radical enough. Yes. Um, and... You know, in a way, it's be, I think part of what people don't do in politics, and probably people would say this about me, <laughs> is try and learn. I've tried to learn from 2015, I've tried to learn from 2017, and I'll try and learn from 2019. And they all have different lessons. 2015, that uh, I had, I think, the, the right analysis, well, I had elements of the right analysis about the country and its problems, inequality, uh, you know, predatory capitalism, all mm -hmm. of those things that I talked about, but I had nowhere near sufficient answers. 2017 showed there was an appetite, I think, for radicalism. 2019 showed, as somebody put it, you can't do a 25-year program in four years. And the salesman matters at least as much and as the, the product. And obviously the salesman matters. I'm no position to lecture people about salesmen. But, well, you were never uh, anywhere near as unpopular as Jeremy Corbyn, oh, so you, you, you're entitled to... That's not well, much of a compliment, Ed. I'm saying, it's no one has ever been anywhere near as unpopular. I know what it's like. You know, I know this sort of shit you get. I mean, well, you do. Like, and and, and that's kind of why, I mean, just going back to... This, yes. you know, this has been my general thing, which is I've tried not to be a commentator. I mean, I, I... I've noticed this, but it makes me wonder what you intend to do with all this learning that you just referred to. Because uh, I don't know yet. It, <laughs> it's, it's a working, because That's in, why I came here. According to, to find cover out. the end of it with a mission. But according to most measures, your political career has peaked already, and yet you're still very young. And clearly, people who weren't familiar with you before or, or with your sort of version 2020, Ed made about yeah. clearly you're still very hungry and very engaged. You're not marking time on the back benches. And yet I come back to the observation that, according to most measures, your political career has peaked. Well, probably true. Probably true. The only the only way it could go higher is if you became leader again and won. Yeah, which isn't going to which isn't going to happen. <laughs> no. Right? Yeah. So so that's true. So what are you going to do with the learning? Well, because right? the point is, I suppose I suppose it's a bit. Uh, so this is the academic if, in you that you didn't think was there because you are interested in coming up with answers. So they're like in the psychiatrist chair. Well, not really uh, the psychiatrist uh, uh, chair. Um, it's just. Uh, um, you're too quick for me. The um, <laughs> rubbish. Uh, so. Yeah, I think just going back to the previous thing you said, yeah. and then I'll come on to that yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it all depends on the word, on what you what you consider has value. I mean, yes. being leader of the Labour Party obviously has value, um, and and you know it is in some sense peak. But you know, contributing ideas also has a different sort of value. Yes, which uh, your dad would have thought was a higher value. Than probably being that is the true, and involved maybe less compromises, <laughs> uh, uh, crappy compromises. <laughs> that, that what I said. Uh, um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I believe in the sort of, you know, I believe the country needs change, which I said at the beginning, yes. and and you know, contributing in some way through ideas, thinking about ideas, yeah. uh, is important. I'm still a, uh, an MP. That's important to me. Um, could you have served in a Jeremy Corbyn cabinet? Yeah. You could have done? Yeah. Um, because I think... Because uh, the job would be worth doing. Well, the job would be worth doing, but also, you know, for all of his flaws, um, he was... He and John McDonnell were speaking to something important, which I did not sufficiently speak to, which is the sense that... You know, they needed to be big. What do, what do I mean by that? Mm. I said, let's cut tuition to be £6,000. They said, let's get rid of them. Yeah. Um, I think they were more right than I was. Um, uh, you know, I said, let's... It, it, I was kind of on my way to public ownership of the railways. They said, let's publicly own the railways. Um, yeah. 
Now, there's interesting questions you learn from 2019 about what I call proof of concept. Mrs. Thatcher proposed in 1979, in her 1979 manifesto, just the privatization of BAA systems mm. and council house sales, not those two things, water, electricity, oh, electricity telecoms, gas. and so yeah. on. You've got, it's a proof of concept yeah. question. Um, so, yeah. I, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, I could have served. Um, and, and these questions still need answers. And these questions still need answers. No, no, I, I mean, that. we still have a problem of sort of privatised monopolies. Of course. Just, just as much as we did. Um, let's go back, because I happen to know that as a teenager... Yeah. ..that you were on LBC quite a lot. This is, this is obviously... I was. I've podcast, destroyed the tapes. This podcast is affiliated <laughs> to LBC, so we should right. probably find out why. I mean, what were you doing? I mean, you were just Ed in... Islington, were you? Really? No, it wasn't Islington. Where was it? Uh, it was Chalk Farm, actually. Edin Chalk Farm. Edin Chalk Farm. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, the Chalk Farmites are rising up. Uh, um, yeah, I, 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 it, there was a program called Jellybone on LBC, which was for young people. Yes. Uh, and I used to ring Clive Bull, who I think is still yeah, on. Absolutely. Uh, legend. LBC Legendary. Um, used to present it. And then there was a program called Young London, which, which used to send young people off to go and review films and plays and music. I was incredibly sort of square, so I didn't really know much about music. Uh, and so I did a bit of that. I like that. So that was never, never a career. What? Tempted into media as opposed to the I, part I, of quite, politics. I quite enjoyed I mean, I quite enjoyed it. We couldn't uh, find the tapes. Few. Have you Thank not got any God. at all? Well, I wouldn't give them to you if well, I no, did. Well, no, you wouldn't, but uh, do they exist? So it's an existential question, maybe not some, editorial one. Maybe, <laughs> so, maybe somewhere in that. <laughs> I just uh, like the idea. Uh, I love the idea. Um, okay, so the path towards politics is opening up before you. By, by the time you're, you're graduated, you've realised that academia is probably not for you and, and you would like to get into Parliament. We haven't mentioned your brother yet, so how conscious... Are you of each other as you as you form these ambitions? Uh, how, how conscious are you of? Well, I'm clearly we're clearly conscious of each other. Well, each other's existence, but each other's ambitions. What? Well, well, I mean, were you, as the younger brother, were you worried about following in footsteps? Or you see, that's the most impatient you've looked so far. That no, no, no. Sorry, it was more. A, it wasn't a contemplation. It was, it was a contemplation, okay, not good. impatience. Um, because uh, uh, it's hard to think of many other. Siblings who rose roughly at, at the same time. I, I mean, I know he served more. I, w I sort of watched him yes. going into Labour... Well, yeah, going into Labour politics. I, you see, I, I spent a bit of time... You go to your media point. After I graduated, um, I spent a bit of time working on a politics programme, Week in Politics, mm. um, and uh, I felt a bit dishonest in the sense that I enjoyed doing it, but I thought, well, I'm a partisan. I'm not really an objective observer. Mm. And um, we did this interview with Harriet Harman, which didn't go so well for her. And she said, oh, well, you know, do you think you might... And then her vacancy opened up in her office. Do you think you might come and work for me? If one thing led to another. Yeah. And um, so I went to work for her. Um, and I, did, I definitely didn't think to myself at the age of... 18, 15, 21, 24, I've got this path of becoming an MP and da 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 da, -da. I mean, No, I'm asking more oh. whether or not there was ever any... We used to talk a lot about politics, yeah, at home, between each other. But yeah. also, David's done that now. I can't... go. You never obviously thought that. You never thought David's done that. I can't follow. No, I thought he was quite a sort of good example. I mean... Right. Um, yeah. And then, and then we come, of course, to the leadership contest well, do we well i think we do i mean we, we we could build up to it more slowly but i i, I, I whichever you prefer I, i'll tell you something i don't know what you'll make of this and and i don't actually know what i make of it but i was talking to a fairly prominent murdoch lieutenant the other day mm -hmm. uh, talking about the broader picture of british politics at the moment because it, it's odd there's not that much love for boris johnson in a lot of the corners of the country that have propelled him into power, largely because the alternative was Jeremy Corbyn. But they said to me, if the other Miliband brother had won, Rupert could have got behind him. And I found that an astonishing observation. And it, 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 I mean, it's neither good nor bad, but if it's true... Well, they speak for themselves. I just don't... I, I'm not... It, part, I'm not on their Christmas card list. But the, na but the narrative is, them. you know this, the wrong brother won the election, and if the other brother had won it, Labour wouldn't have been in the wilderness for since... 2010. I mean, you can't run history as a counterfactual. I mean, I, I'm not going to... 
no. say I knew what would have happened. You know what I mean? I, of I just, course I do, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, my reasons for standing were I felt I had something distinctive to say about the country. Yes. About the issues that, that New Labour had. The subtext addressed. is always going to be he doesn't, though, isn't it? That's why it was such a psychodrama for the British public. You, even if it's not true, even if you, you, he'd be your second choice, you're still saying there's something wrong with We're you. We're different people who had yeah. different perspectives. I mean, you know, it feels like a long time. It was nine years ago, um, more than nine years ago. It's still a defining moment in sure, your life, sure, sure, personal sure. and course, political, of course. which is, which is uh, rare. Of course. Um, uh, Do you regret it? No. Are you sure? Yeah, I don't because... Well, A, I don't think you can go through life with regrets. Well, you know, but and secondly, you have a few. <laughs> no, and, and secondly, I feel like the distinctive things I had to say yes. remain as relevant. And he wouldn't have said them. He'd have said different. He said different yeah. things, and then people I'm not made, trying to reignite a few. Yeah, yeah. I'm just interested uh, in how you And he said different things, and personally. and you know. And the party made a choice, a narrow choice, and then the country made a choice not to um, not to vote for me and to vote for David Cameron. When you elected to run in the leadership campaign, did you realistically think you were in with a proper chance of winning? Yeah. You, OK, because it's interesting just to watch the current campaign underway. One or two of those characters must know they haven't got a hope in hell of winning, so they're, they're running... You can never tell how these things work. I, well, I was always true. pretty kind of... I thought I always thought I had a good chance because I, I thought I was, well, I mean, it, I, it's interesting this because the decision to run was made after the general election, yes. but the my sense of frustration, I, I'm very praising of what lots of things New Labour did, but my sense of frustration about some of the things it didn't do and some of the issues that went unaddressed had been there for a long time. Um as anyone on the inside would say, and therefore it didn't, you know, didn't that in that sense my position and my perspective didn't come from nowhere. Of course, it was a difficult decision to make. But there was clear blue water or clear red water between. Well, there was. I mean, there's a triangulation here. It's quite odd, actually. It's never occurred to me before. So, you ran against David Miliband because you wanted to move the party away from business as usual, away or away from Blair, Blair, Blairish business as usual, without. Trashing that legacy, um, or that's... characterizing him anyway. No, yeah. of course I get yeah. all of the. But that's I'll let you develop your thesis. That's yeah. the triangulation, isn't it? Because then Corbyn came along, and and after your electoral failure, in many ways, but for 2017, the path was clear for a genuine abandonment of what what happened up to 2010. Uh, whereas what what you said earlier suggests to me that in 2015, if you were doing it now, you'd probably have gone further than you did. Yes. And so, so, so that I, I just wonder what tethered you. Because I was, uh, I was, well, I won a narrow victory, and I was sort of trying to bridge to the. I was trying to bridge to the sort of exactly. future beyond New Labour, and it's yes. quite and it's sort of Without. moving moving away from one position to another is quite. It's quite particularly when you've just come out of government. It's quite a hard thing. Hard thing yes, to do. the only way they managed to do it in the end was by completely trashing the legacy of what had gone before. So there was more vitriol directed at centrists and Blairites under the last, like, well, the current Labour leadership than there was at Yeah, and I don't like that. No, it's um, bizarre. It's, it's electoral suicide for a start, but it's quite bizarre just to think that it's people's front of Judea stuff, isn't it, really? It's too, it was too sectarian. Yeah. I mean, I sort of, you know, I, I kind of liked the radicalism. I didn't like the sectarianism. Mm. Um, mm. Now you might ask, does the do the two automatically go together? Well, I, I nearly did actually, but then I thought to myself, <laughs> they don't. They obviously don't. Have I don't to go think together. they do have. Although to go that's the joke, isn't it, in Monty Python? That's why the people's front of Judea stuff is so funny because they're saying, of course, you can't have one without the other. But it's not as simple as people's front of Judea. Um. Okay. So, are you okay to carry on? Well, well like we didn't. Not. We were there. We were before you told us about the I fucking know, bomb outside. Not with guilt. I was like, <laughs> are they saying we've got to evacuate? No, they're not evacuating us. But we're not on Dean Street. Not Dean Street. Well, they would have come to tell us if there was any problem. It, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> We've got to leave that in. We interrupt. Yeah, can we you've leave, leave the exploded bomb? You've really that's got to. You've really got to. We interrupt this podcast. Yeah, really, God. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> You've not been paying attention to this podcast. You've really got to leave that in. Outrageous. Uh, so no, I'm getting that. I'm getting a clearer picture now of, of that. Of, uh, oddly, of that. What of was that, I saying? Of that triangulation. Can't what I was saying. We're talking about the difficulties of being radical without being sectarian, and and I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I can't think, think of a precedent for that. Well, if you look at what's happening in the American primary, and we're on the day mm. day of the Iowa speaking on the day of the Iowa caucuses. I mean, it's interesting what's happened, isn't it? Because it's not a it's not only in Britain where there's been this move no. away from the third way, so called Clinton Blair, to something more radical. But I think that's because the, the, the I think that's because the times and the circumstances I've talked about some of them already, climate mm. inequality, mm. demand are demanding it. And, you know. and and yet the people currently riding high on the hog are I mean, very close to, if not funded by, the people that want to deny climate change and, and who benefit the most from inequality. That's the, that's the riddle of our, of our times, isn't it, on both sides of the Atlantic. So you become leader, um, just, as you remind us, and then everything changes, the glare, because a lot of people portray Jeremy Corbyn as having suffered unprecedented abuse from the British press. I'm always reminded of the headline about your dad that simply said, the man who hated mm. Britain. And, I, I, do you know, oddly, I think the reason I remember that so keenly is because I lost my dad around about that time. Mm. And, I, and I just thought... I don't think I've ever sworn on this podcast, but that's what I thought. Those people, how can you do... I didn't know you. I, the second time I met, third yeah. time I met, we bumped into each yeah. other at the station the other yeah, day. Yeah. But... That man, that stinks. How do you how do you process that? Yeah, it's pretty shit. But I mean, I don't know really. I I, I kind of thought, <laughs> you know, I kind of thought, well, it's one thing for them to you. have a go at me. Yes. And then Dacre's Dacre's whole, you know, Paul Dacre, the editor of the Mail. Yeah. It, was, it was such a sort of whole. Oh, I mean, it just you know, I wanted a right of reply. The mm. person gave me a right of reply, but then they sort of gave me the right of reply, and then sort of you know, pistol over the right of reply. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. he did hate Britain. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, oh. um, it's not, they, 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 you know, they just don't like that. That's the sort of I'm afraid that's the attitude, isn't it? Uh, no, no, nothing's off limits if you are in the other tribe, regardless of how. Articulate the description of that. No, I mean it's sort of what's kind of one of the many unattractive things about being a frontline, particularly Labour politician. I'm not saying only Labour. Is oh, the sort there's of, no left wing equivalent of Paul Dacre. He's not editor of the Daily Mail no. anymore, but his legacy will yeah. persist for generations. Yeah. There's no left wing equivalent of that. No, no, no one would ever. I mean, look at Boris Johnson's personal life and, and the idea of what a left wing Paul Dacre no, would sure, do with exactly. his personal. It doesn't bear thinking about. I just focus on that headline because that that. I imagine, must have been the closest you ever come to wondering why the hell you're doing this at all. Yeah, you, you definitely think that. But I, oh, I think when I was the leader, the cause of trying to win and trying to make the country better, fairer, as, and so on, as I saw it, was the thing that drives you past those things. Yes, of course. Well, it you has know, to, doesn't you've it? You've just got to sort of... You know, you've got to operate with blink, you know, real blinkers. Yes. Um, not read. Well, social media was an early, earlier incarnation in those days, and perhaps a nicer incarnation. But just not read the papers and just sort of, you know, get on with it. Yes. And I, I, think, had, I had Lisa Nandy in the studio the other day, and she said she'd removed it all social media from her phone because otherwise, yeah, you, you definitely no can't time for anything else. And and some but, elements of traditional media listening to you would have fallen into that category what is to be gained from yeah. immersing myself in the definitely in the pools of vitriol that the daily mail are printing but it is about you so it's always very difficult to walk past a door when you know that people on the other side of that door are talking about you but when you reach a stage in life as leader of the opposition you do then almost every door you walk past there's probably people behind it so the the the, the urge to stick your ear to the keyhole diminishes with experience i mean i i but I always found, I say, I used to say that being leader of the Labour Party and then people recognising you and coming up to you always made you have a much more, me, have a much more positive view of human nature than I'd get from reading yes. the mail. Because to your face, people yeah, are more people, honest and nicer. Yeah, people are just... People the are, cloak of anonymity. People are sort of nicer, yeah. yeah I and I think that. social media probably that makes that... 
a lot more a, a, a lot more tr- a lot more true yeah i know i think you're probably right um um, I mean, I think actually politics is more toxic now than when I was doing it, notwithstanding everything you said about the the stuff I got and all sure. of that. I think it is more toxic and it is more horrible. I think I think Brexit, and I don't need to tell you this, but I think Brexit has sort of unleashed uh, toxicity about politics. Yes, there's an involvement. And in politics. Yes. No, well, well that's why I remember the headline, because it stuck out so much. Yeah, and, and arguably, yeah maybe, in, maybe it would be less unusual yeah, today. Yeah, maybe it wouldn't stick out quite so much. Um, did you think you were going to... I mean, on the night of 2015, did you think you were over the line? Well, I wasn't sure, but I was hopeful, yeah. Yeah. Because it looked like the sort of polls were moving in my... I remember. ...direction, and it looked like the polls during that day, I think, were moving in that direction, and the polls were wrong. <laughs> Damn those, damn those polls. It's like when people say to me, I often meet people and they say almost unconsciously, unconsciously, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're having a sort of chat with them about something and then they'll say, particularly Labour Party people, they'll say, yeah, 2015, I mean, it was just terrible. When that exit poll came out, I mean, God, I was just, I, you know, I was just really upset and I was like, yeah, I kind of know how you feel. <laughs> oh, my uh, point. <laughs> What's it like? Is it like getting punched in the tummy? That initial, oh, that definitely first, worse, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Um, of course, yes. Uh, oh, just not not good, no. I mean, obviously, because, you know, I sort of worked for it for, a, you know, five years or whatever. Um, yeah, it was sort of bad. <laughs> no kidding. I wouldn't recommend that. Well, well, I don't... But, I mean, yeah. But, you know, life goes on, but it's hard. Yes, and and, and the more... It's weird, this. It's never occurred to me before. But when you look at the, the, the old Etonian school of prime minister, which is two out of the last three, there is a sense that this is sort of the only job I can think of that's commensurate with my background and, and sense of self. I, I know friends of Boris Johnson and David Cameron uh, who would describe, surprisingly perhaps, David Cameron possibly has even been more of a conveyor belt politician than Boris Johnson. Whereas your disappointment that night, I don't want to do a hagiography, but you're not thinking about the personal loss or humiliation, or you're, you're thinking almost immediately about the missed opportunity because you were raised in this house where changing the world was. Yeah, although you also th- oh, on in. Well, it's not much fun on a personal no. level, I grant you, but there's a difference, there's a distinction there, I think. Ah, uh, because yeah, the pursuit I of want power to be, isn't. I don't know. Uh, right. Yeah, I, well, I can't speak for. Cam- I just sort of feel I can't speak for Cameron or. Or you know, well, I suppose you're not putting Theresa May in the same category, but I can't speak no. for Cameron. I don't, I, you know, I, I'm not in his sort of mind mind as to what he feels. But I mean, just for my part, you obviously feel personal. Obviously, felt deep personal disappointment. You know, I'd let people down, um, and but but more let you know the people who needed mm. a Labour government. That's what I mean by the uh, missed yeah. opportunity rather yeah. than the missed, yeah, missed and that's, victory. And that's sort of um, that is definitely hard. And how hard was it? To hard, stand hard. Down. No, oh, to, to, I mean, oh no, that wasn't that wasn't hard. And, and again, I know you don't have any regrets. It's sort of the Edith yeah. Piaf, anti Edith Piaf yeah. politics. But when you look at, I mean, do, do you no, think the Edith Piaf? Yes. Yeah. Do, do you think the um, you should have stuck around for a little bit longer, given what's happened since? Given what is it true that the only reason the electoral system in the party facilitated Jeremy Corbyn is because Eric Joyce punched that? politician in the house of commons well there's two separate things going on here i mean one is should i have stayed for yes. a few months after the general election of 2015 in my view it would have made i really don't believe it would have made much difference no i mean well i mean oddly I, enough see, i would agree with you until people mention the referendum well that would have been that would have the, the, look, the party was not in the mood I, i'd come from having a hung parliament yes. to a tory majority the party wasn't in the mood for you hanging around. another what it would have been you know well it turned you'd out 15 provi- you'd have provided proper leadership in a referendum well maybe that's nice of you to say but i mean oh well, it's not i mean it's a presumption you know oddly enough when i lost people said we well, shouldn't have left and then when corbyn lost everybody said why is he still hanging yeah, around i mean point. You know, it's yes. slightly like it is, you, it? You, you can't win. But Game theory. Well, no, it's more like um, David Axelrod, um, Obama's guy who, who did a bit of work for me, said, you know, you're never as dumb as you look when you win or as smart as you... Uh, you're never as dumb as you look when you lose or as smart as you look when you win. And it and it's True, sort of... It? and it, uh, You know, I mean, I, I kind of... 
I don't I don't think uh, Neil I spoke to Neil Kinnock that day after the election he said it was absolute purgatory staying around I thought people needed to have a debate including about me mm. I thought it's much harder to have a debate about me if I'm still there yes. I mean and when you say about me you mean about your your campaign your what, well my leadership what, you know yeah. it's it, that it, yeah everything was on the table but you know you allow me one really simplistic question Go on. if you could pick one thing that you would have done differently in the run-up to election day 2015 or or something over which you had no control but you wish you could excise from the history books what would it be <clears throat> um i think it, this you'll think this is this isn't supposed to be a not an answer no. but i think i would have been clearer about I, I think i would have been more radical and clear about my radicalism and that not only a sort of diagnosis of why the country needed big change but bigger change i think if you added up all the change we were proposing it maybe added up to big change but i think it just more of a sense of i i, I think you you know you paint in primary colors yeah. as a leader and i think i should have painted more in primary colors when it came to what we were going to change um, and uh, I remember we were having this debate about tuition fees and whether we should indeed cut them to £6,000 or whether we should sort of do some even more half assed compromise. <laughs> and I remember talking to my, it was, I happened to have one holiday, and I remember saying to Justine, you know, um, what do you think about this tuition fees? And she, she said, well, you should be bloody well abolishing them. Straight up. Well, and, and so, you know, in a way, yeah. I think it's sort of, it's this kind of primary cut. It's a sort of yeah. primary cut. I'm not saying that I'd abolish tuition for the one the election, blah, but, you know, it's just more... Well, you're describing an incremental approach. Incrementalism, rather, rather than a... yeah. And I think, you know, it's, like, it's so hard because, as I said, 2017 was a sort of corrective to 2015 and yes. then 2019 was a corrective to 2017. So it's like, how do you get the balance here? Well, it's true. I, I, we've met once before. The first time we met, and people won't believe this because they think that we both go to several a week. It's the only North London dinner party that I've ever been to. Right, yeah. And I met Justine, who, who is, um, it, it, I mean, just fundamentally an incredibly bright human being, isn't she? So I can see why you lean so heavily on her. But I asked you about immigration. We haven't mentioned immigration at all today. And yet, in many ways, it's the defining issue of 20, the second decade of, of, of 21st century politics in Britain. And I think I'd had a wine. A wine. I think I'd had a wine at this point in proceedings. So I, I started lecturing you on the approach that the Labour Party <laughs> should have taken to immigration. And you, I realise now, were dealing with a drunk at a party. So you said something like, well, you should be an MP, which is obviously a <laughs> very polite way to say, yeah, all right, piss off. Get back in your box. No, I'm sure but, I genuinely thought Well, it. it's possible, but... but I still think it. You're very kind. I'm still young. There it is. But but that, you're not. That, a, you haven't passed your peak. Not that, that, <laughs> political peak. The um, that that was huge. We haven't mentioned it at all, which is not remiss and it's not deliberate on either of our part. But but if you were talking about being radical and primary colours, that was probably where you were at your greyest or your most pastel on immigration, trying to please everybody, even this nativist, the mug. Remember the mug? That was on your watch. Don't pull your faces on me. I know, I know, but honestly, I mean, who knew about the mug at the time? I mean, honestly, I'm not saying the mug was a good idea. It wasn't, but, I mean, I, I, I was... Know, but it spoke of the mood. No, but it, it, the point is there's this sort of ex post facto thing which yes. you hear, which is that some, somehow I was sort of dog-whistling away on immigration. No, no one has it, said you were dog-whistling well, away. Well, they have, actually. Oh, OK, well, not in the context yeah. of this conversation. I'm taking on board... I was trying... I tell you what, what let, you me tell, about let me tell you I was colours. trying to do. Yeah. And actually... Uh, you know, I didn't succeed. I was trying to basically say concerns about immigration have a class dimension to them when they are about the undercutting of wages and, you know, to some extent pressures on public services. But my main, my main focus was on what was happening in a the, the collision of a very deregulated labour market and immigration. Yes. Because I saw it in my own constituency. And now, the economists all say, well, there's zero effect. I don't really buy the fact that there's zero effect. Now, you can say it's marginal effect, and it's and obviously it's not the main reason why we have low wages in this country and so on, but I was trying to speak to that, and I was, I was always unbelievably careful in the words I said yes. about how I spoke about this issue so that it precisely wasn't a dog whistle. 
So either you you take the very lazy and dangerous path of saying to people all of your grievances are down to immigration, e exactly. or, or you allude to that, like a lot of people who are doing very well at the moment have done, or because I hadn't, or you don't talk about the issue at all. Bingo, yes. And the problem was that but, you know, but, but we hadn't really talked about the issue, and I've, you know, I would spend time and you know, I, I really would talk to people who worked with me. I was just. I was incredibly, and maybe I was too nuanced about it, yes. but I was trying to talk about it in a way that was consistent with progressive values, but didn't just say, we just don't talk about that issue. Right. But you couldn't champion it either because you genuinely believed that some of these grievances were sound. I think, I, don't, I wouldn't say that, I, I understood the concerns people had about the fact that we were operating in this particularly deregulated labour market mm. where wages could be driven down and we were seeing massive changes happening in our society. And I think labour, I'm not saying I found the right way of talking about those things, but you have to find a way of talking about them without giving up on your values. Yes. Yes, because otherwise, arguably, what's just happened in 2019 could happen and people would feel that that you've abandoned them as a, as a party, that the Labour Party has abandoned them. You're talking about Brexit? Yeah. Well, no, I'm talking about the election result and the whole, yeah, yeah. The whole, just the sense behind it, whether you want to blame it on Corbyn or on Brexit. I mean, I think by 2019, the Brexit element of the election yeah. had gone beyond immigration to a more fundamental thing about... I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I had on, on the doorstep, but we knocked on 7,000 doors sure. during the election, where it would go... Um, I would say, well, I wasn't in favour of this referendum. Mm. And people would say, well, I agree with you, but I voted leave and you asked us, right? Yeah. So you asked us the question yeah. and then... We didn't you want didn't to be like, asked. We didn't want to be asked. No, you know, we didn't want to be asked. Yeah. I mean, genuinely, yeah. we didn't want to be asked, but you asked us the question and then you tried to ignore us. Yes. Uh, and, you know, the problem was, this goes back to the point about the, the uh, depth of the problems in society... I'm not saying it's all about inequality because that's too simplistic, but there was a sense of 30, 40 years when, although good things were done by the Labour government, the very deregulated way in which the world of work had changed, uh, you know, lots of industrial jobs gone, not properly replaced, warehouse jobs, low wages, all of that had not been addressed. Mm. Investment in constituencies like mine, you know. But it became impossible to address it without immigration being part of the which it shouldn't necessarily have been but the media political nexus made it impossible to talk about any of these things without somebody in the audience or somebody in the panel or somebody doing the interview saying but what about immigration and that must have been very frustrating during the 2015 election yeah well during the last 10 years arguably i mean you you say something about jobs you say something about public yeah. services and chummo over there has got his hand in the air saying yeah okay but you know what my explanation for this is oh. or my answer to this and again it's not going to come out as very uh a, a sort of complete answer is i would say unless the left has a better explanation for the problems people see in their lives than it's all the fault of immigration because you've got a housing problem, a, you know, NHS problem, a wages problem, it's all the fault of the immigrants. Mm. Uh, unless, you know... Now, the 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 what the Corbyn era was trying to do was... Well, what I was trying to do was say, look, it's, a, it's rather wonky, as you'd expect. <laughs> the, 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 this is a particular form of very unequal capitalism that is producing this. You know, it's producing this yeah. society. This is changeable, but unless you make the rich pay their fair share of taxes, invest properly, have government playing its proper role, unless you will do all of those things, these problems are going to persist. And I, I'd have this argument with people, say, look, it's not immigration that's the reason why you've got housing problems. We haven't built any bloody council houses for 30, 40 years. I'm afraid, including under the Labour government, people hate yes. it. Labour people hate it when I say, point this out about the Labour government. You know, for anyone watching, it doesn't mean to say, I'm not proud of the things the Labour government did, d yes. did but we didn't build enough council houses. Yes. Because, you know, in the 30 years no after... In, in the 30 years after the Second World War, on average, Labour and Tory governments built 125,000 council homes per year... Mm. In the thirty, in the last thirty years, it's about twenty thousand per year, twenty-five thousand per year. We should end with a little look at the current incumbent at, at number ten Downing Street. Yeah, you didn't speak very warmly of David Cameron. I don't know if that was just the, the the set of your face, but you referred to him by surname. 
Um, is it, we've done a few politicians on full disclosure, but I don't, I don't, I try not to hate my political opponents because I think. It, but you've got a problem I, with David Cameron. No, what a problem? What, what do you mean a problem? Well, I'm not accusing you of hating him, but if, if I think for he example, made a, Michael Heseltine and Ken Clark have both sat in this chair recently, and they can speak very warmly of Labour I think politicians made that a very, defeated them. I think he made a very bad decision on the referendum. On the referendum, yeah. it's uh, huge, right? I mean, that's epochal. He, yeah, I think that's. Fair to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm usually prone to understate. Uh, I think it's fair to say. But but I said to him right from the get go when he took when I took over in 2010, because I don't think he had the best relationship with Gordon. I think it's sure. sort of not you know it's kind of probably widely known. Mm. Uh, you know I said it's look it's important for us to try and work together on things we can agree on. And you know I don't I don't I so in a way I think it's I, it is not a sort of this is not a sort of pose, but I no. try not to have personal animus Good. against my political opponents well, it because, you up. I, yeah, it leads you up and it sort of clouds your judgment. And it's like any exceptions? Anyone you are prepared to harbour a personal animus towards? Uh, not really. But what's the point oh. in having? Not, not, <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I can't. No one springs to mind. I wouldn't be doing my I job mean, if I didn't. What's ask. the point of having? What's What's the point? Well, there comes a point where there are political figures who are repellent and and. Arguably, we're quite close to that point in Britain now. It's fa yeah, I mean, look, I, 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 I sort of hate the way Johnson ran the first few months of his premiership and just the sort of kind of uh, his his sort of flirtation with the sort of Bannonite, yes. you know, right, and the willingness to say anything and do anything. I actually think that's kind of worse, if I can yeah. say that. Uh, I, I, I actually said this publicly, and Justine was like, I can't believe you're defending Cameron. And I, and I was like, well, like, I, think exactly can, I think John, no, I think Johnson's worse. Uh, yes. In fact, that was sort of Cameron's argument, wasn't yes. it, in his well, book? It was yes. sort of, I haven't read the book, but it was sort of like, you may think I was a so-and-so, but, yeah. you know, the next guy yeah. uh, after sure. Theresa May is worse. And he, he would know with the um, uh, first uh, year psychodrama. Yeah. Um, so how bad is Johnson potentially? But leave, bearing in mind that you bear no politician's <laughs> personal animus. I mean, did, did, did some of us, I'm quite scared, not in a querulous or snowflakey way, but you mentioned the flirtation with, with Bannonite politics. If, if, you know, with a majority of 80, if he wanted to consummate that relationship, then it could be quite scary, the relationship with I the ideology. I honestly can't judge him. I mean, I, I, I find him absolutely... Beyond judgment, I, I spent as in unreadable, uh, uh, unreadable. Yes. So, so um, the I was on the Olympic bus. Uh, you're wondering where this story is going, uh, <laughs> which got a lot. The longest time I spent with him was the Olympic bus that was going to the opening ceremony, right. which got lost. <laughs> uh, uh, it had him, Tessa Jowell, the commander of the Metropolitan Police, the head of the mm. army. Um, I don't think oh. Cameron wasn't on the bus. Right. Um, anyway, so I, that's the longest I've chatted to him. I wonder what would happened to British politics if that bus had stayed lost. <laughs> well, maybe you might say it was of great advantage <laughs> uh, for all concerned. Anyway, so and uh, at that point, people said, well, he's a much nicer guy than they did. Cameron. He's more sort of, you know, relatable. He's more, cares more, etc. So I, I don't know. I just can't. I mean, he seems to, he obviously seems like pretty flexible. <laughs> I'm trying to be as generous as possible, malleable in his political what he's willing to say. Yes. Um, often in the same speech. Uh, often in the same speech. That's quite <laughs> Trump-like. Yes. Uh, he obviously has got this, uh, won these some of these seats in the north of England. So he obviously thinks he's got to move. Well, the mood music is he's got yeah. to move to the centre. But the thing about this, people kind of are a bit simplistic about this. Well, he can just move to the centre and it will be fine. Yeah. He's got to take on some free market sort of shibboleths in doing that. Mm. Well, what is he going to do about the low wage economy? You know, what is he going to do about building shed loads of council houses and social housing, which we need to do to solve the housing crisis? That was part of this cross body shelter social housing commission. So that's why yeah. part one of the reasons I sort of know a bit about it. Uh, you know, is he going to now? Maybe he's sufficiently flexible. I mean, there is something odd happened, isn't there, in British politics, which is. In some ways, while the election result the election result was terrible, some of the debate has, over the last eight or ten years, moved to the left, mm. hasn't it? Mm. I mean, 
you know, when I was saying some of the things I was saying, and not just energy price cap, but, you know, pre the speech I made about predators, producers, yes. you know, predatory capitalists, it was seen as like, this guy's gone bonkers. Yes, and now it's like, yeah. it would be it's unremarkable. So some of that has... Could you imagine the Conservatives adopting some of it as well? You know, they've nationalised a little bit of the sure. railway we'll see. for now. Yes. Uh, um, so do you, like everybody else, look at Boris Johnson and don't know which Boris Johnson you're looking at? So you can't offer, you can't give a substantive answer to any question I ask you now because who knows? Who, no, that's sort of what's in is. a way kind of da uh, dangerous about him. I do think this though, which is, you know, this year is supposed to be a very big year on the climate emergency. Yeah. Uh, we're hosting. This was something the government was very keen to get last year. Uh, COP26 is the conference of the parties, the international conference on climate change uh, in Glasgow in November. I mean, they've made a haul of it so far. Um, you know, they appointed Claire Perry O'Neill, then they've got rid of her. Yes. Um, they need to get a grip on that. And that, and the reason I mention that is because Europe is absolutely pivotal to this. I mean, it's rather interesting sort of microcosm of what, the, what today's world with Trump means because... In 2015, before Paris, the Paris Climate Summit, Summit it was a US-China axis that really made it a success. Yes. It's going to be an EU-China axis that's got to make it a success this time because mm -hmm. Trump's, America's out of the game, essentially. The, the summit happens two weeks after the presidential elections. There's an EU-China summit in September. I don't, presumably we're not going to be there. Incredible. I mean, you know, it does yeah. show something about this world and why the EU is important in this world and why... While we've, we're out of the European Union, I'd be getting as close to them as I can on issues like this. Much prospect of that with this government in this climate? I mean, it doesn't look like it, does it? It doesn't. I mean, it looks like they're, it looks like they're sort of... Going the other way, tacking towards... And the climate. thing about this climate thing is I just don't think they've understood how, you know, how complicated it is and how important it is. Ed Miliband. Thank you. No, thank you.